right. Well, welcome everybody today. Um, this is a trauma-informed youth yoga practices um, interview um, topic that I'm having today with the wonderful Linnea Gillen of Yoga Calm. And thank you so much, Linnea, for joining us today and for giving us your expertise and lots of great information about um, trauma-informed practices and how yoga, mindfulness, meditation, breathing can uh, help support individuals as they begin to hopefully heal and work through trauma. You're really welcome. Appreciate it. Great to be here. So to begin with, can you tell us a little bit about your background and your work with Yoga Calm and, um, and just kind of how you have come to know so much about trauma-informed practices? Okay. So in order to tell you about that, I kind of need to go back a ways because I have a trauma background myself, personally. Um, my, my ACE score, now that they have the ACE scores, is very high. Um, and so when I, f I found yoga at 16, which was a godsend to me, my father sent me to a camp and I learned soothing skills that were tremendous. And even though I was only at the camp for a week, I, fall, I found yoga for the rest of my life and used it. And immediately when I was a preschool teacher and then an elementary school teacher, I started teaching the children right away because I was sharing with them and helping them regulate because it helped me to regulate. Mm -hmm. So that's the beginning of it. And yoga, so I, I wanted to say a little bit about the yoga and meditation because initially it was very, very soothing mm -hmm. and calming. But then after a while, the poses started to open up the trauma, the pain, the anger, the sorrow. And the yoga world at that time didn't know anything about that really. When I went to my yoga teachers, they just kept, kept saying, do more yoga, do more meditation. And then I started having nightmares and flooded with anger and flooded with sorrow and no amount of meditation was relieving it. So then I was able to find a counselor and some other practices that helped me actually to release the feelings that were being brought out by moving the body. So that's when I started to do that work for myself and um, did a lot of work with a counselor, with Native American practitioners, with a lot of different healers, including yoga. And then I became a counselor myself. And right away, I wanted to marry the body with the meditation and the yoga and, and also allow the expression of the pain to come out while we were practicing. So Yoga Calm developed over many, many years. I mean, it was early 70s when I first started using it with children. <coughs> and I apologize, I have a cold. Um, but it wasn't really until I was a school counselor and I was working with working in behavior classrooms with severely traumatized children that the the procedures that I developed began to cap, you know, form more fully. <clears throat> Fabulous. So, yeah, I know I have the Yoga Calm book, and as I read it, I was like, oh, okay, you can really see your counseling background, um, yes. you know, front and center in, in that program. Um, and so, you know, when I was first um, beginning to explore trauma-informed practices, I, I referred to your book quite a bit. Um, okay. So thank you very much for providing that resource to um, to yoga instructors and kids kids yoga specialists. It's, it's a lovely uh, lovely resource. Thank you. Um, so you talk about ACEs, about your right. ACE score. So can right. you explain what that is for people okay. who might be watching this and are not familiar what ACEs are? Right. So ACE means adverse childhood experiences. And this, um, this questionnaire came out of some work done at Kaiser around a few doctors who were working with um, women who were struggling with weight. And they found a really good way to help women and men, I think, I'm not sure, I don't think there were any men in this study, lose weight. But what they were finding is some, certain women would gain weight back really quickly. And they started to look at their adverse childhood experiences scores. And they made a rating or a questionnaire, really, of different things that um, could happen. And it turns out that the women that were having a lot of trouble keeping to the program and keeping the weight off had very high uh, adverse childhood experience scores. So they began to really look at that, and that's kind of that's caught on, and mm -hmm. people are beginning to look at ACE scores now and talk about them in that way, and really begin to understand that having a lot of adverse childhood experiences impacts many things in your life. So it's it's been an amazing thing to have. There are actually also a lot of things that aren't in it mm -hmm. because of the population they were working with. They were finding certain kinds of abuse, so they were working with the abuse that was present in that population. Um, if you were working with a different population, you would probably have other things. Like, for instance, war isn't on there. 
mm -hmm. exposure to war. And some of us have are working with children that are coming from places where they've been exposed to war and their ACE score might not show that they've got a lot of trauma, but their trauma may be way up there, maybe even higher than mine, even though my higher, my score is quite high. Right. Poverty so, isn't on there. Yeah. So, you know, so people can find ACE questionnaires right. online. They're right. fairly re uh, readily available. Right. And um, I think it's really important to look at, as you say, what is included and some of the things that aren't included. You know, sometimes there's primary traumatic events and then there's also right. secondary traumatic events. And many of the secondary traumatic events aren't included or hereditary traumatic events, those type of surgery. things. Even surgery yeah. and illness isn't on there. Mm -hmm. So, and, and sometimes people have both and that really tells us a lot. And also duration isn't on there. Age yeah. of onset isn't on there. Like an abuse that occurs at 13 is quite different than an abuse that occurs at six months. So, you know, it's a great start and we're making yeah. headway in this area of trauma, but we have to really look at the whole picture. Exactly. In order to know so, the of us. yeah. So what I'm hearing from you is it's a wonderful tool, but it's not the end all and be all. So it's a, a really good um, starting off point. But then to have our our blinders off and right. maybe consider um, additional things. You know, I always kind of chuckle when I see the statistic that three. They often say about three out of four adults have had at least one um, adverse childhood experience, and I'm like, Are you kidding me, right? I don't know a single adult who hasn't had one. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and and by so, the time you're 20, you've had more. Multiple, you know? multiple yeah. right? And I think that sometimes that statistic comes from a lot. People don't report. Right. Right. Um, things right. happen in your life, and you just you're told to suck it up. You're told that's just life. That's just what happens. Um, right. And to get on with it. Uh, exactly. And so we don't necessarily recognize that we've had. A traumatic experience and sometimes we're also it may depend on the environment that we're in whether it's a supportive environment that we can build resiliency from right or an unsupportive environment that we're kind of left floundering right, right. yeah there is a resiliency test that has been developed that some people give along with the ACE but it doesn't seem that many people are getting the resiliency test so I think it's helpful to put those to give the test and then also look at the resiliency test to see how many of the resiliency tools the person has or the child has. Fabulous. Well, thank you very much. All right. Yeah. So I want to get into a little bit about the, the what's happening in the brain, about the neurobiology of what happens when we have a traumatic event and kind of what are some results, you know, in the brain, in the body of a traumatic event. Right. So a traumatic event, shuts off the prefrontal cortex, our thinking part of the brain. And one of the things I tell children is that it turns on this response, this fight, flight, or freeze response. And that response is really important. We, like I tell the children that it's ha faster than thought for a reason. Because if we, if a car was coming at us really fast and we said, oh look, there's a car coming at us, we better get out of the way. By the time we had that thought, we'd be gone. Mm -hmm. So we have this response in our body and the prefrontal cortex shuts down and other parts of the brain light up, including the emotional parts of the brain. And that is designed to get us out of danger. But when children have had a lot of trauma or chronic stress, which also affects the brain in the same way, the um, parts of the brain that respond to trauma are lighting up all the time. And if you see a brain scan of a tr for certain with PTSD, it's lit up in many, many places, whereas somebody that doesn't have PTSD, you'll see the prefrontal cortex lit up when they're doing an activity more regularly. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it's, it's that fight or flight. And I think it's important to realize it's not just the brain, it's the brain body reaction because all kinds of things are also happening in the body. Mm -hmm. You know, your body is creating chemicals, your muscles tighten, you come into the fetal response, your jaw tightens. So our whole body responds to that fight or flight. And over time, that does change the brain. It changes the way our brain operates it. Because if we are in that fight or flight response all the time, then our brain gets conditioned to be that way. And it's not very relaxing. Yeah. Well, and we almost don't know how to relax. We're either hypervigilant, right. right? It's like, oh, scanning, scanning, there's going to be danger somewhere. Or hypovigilant, and we're tuned out, and we're disassociated, right? Right. And neither one of those are healthy states to be. Right. Or really very fun. No. <laughs> you know? 
it's kind of nice to be present in your experience and kind of nice not to be alarmed at all times. Mm -hmm. Right. And well, and important for being able to connect with people, being able to learn, being able to have a healthy, happy life. Right. Exactly. Right. Uh, and this is really what our goal is when we're working with children and how, giving them yoga skills and mindfulness skills. It's like, I want you to have a healthy, healthy, happy life. <laughs> yes, exactly. And enjoy it. Yeah. And find All right, the so balance. I get this question a lot when I start talking about trauma <laughs> is a lot of my teacher trainees, they come in and say, well, how do we know what are some of the behaviors that might be exhibited for a child if they have had a traumatic event because um, a lot of the statistics say that one in four preschool children will have already experienced a traumatic event or maybe multiple traumatic events right. um, and so even from a very young age we as right. um, individuals who are working with youth and with children need to be aware that this is pervasive and right. how can we then kind of you know children come in and we're like oh okay this is what you're doing you're not maybe misbehaving because you're a bad kid but this may right. be a symptom of trauma what are some of right. those behaviors that we could um see yes so to start with the fight flight and freeze is a good place if the child is running like climbing under a chair or climbing under a table and curled up in a fetal position and won't come out that's a trauma response they're trying to regulate their body so that's a cue right there or anytime they just dash you all you also see that bright look in their face like a, a face of uh, fear or mm. shock you know and then they and they don't think you ask them a question and they might say something random or something disconnected from the situation that's another um thing to see so or else they go into fight they want to fight like that you know their body is ready for a fight that then they might be stuck in that fight response and their body is getting triggered really easily um, or they freeze, where that means their their eyes are kind of blank. They don't respond. They don't have a lot of um, you know physical strength. They don't have a lot of tone in their body. They just kind of let let go. They've mm -hmm. given up. There's a helplessness or a hopelessness yeah. to them. Yeah, so yeah. It's like I'm not even here anymore. If I'm not here, then it will pass. Right. And then I can come back to being me. Right. Right. And some live in that state. Some children that have been very traumatized live in the in several of those states a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing to look for. The other is that if an emotion is bigger than the moment, and here's the this is the trickiest part I found, because there is indulgence as well. And there is manipulation. And sometimes children throw fits because they want their way. But sometimes there are emotional storms, as I call them. I like to call them storms because they're little, um, it's less personal, that, you, that aren't about getting their own way. It's like a huge trigger has occurred and they're now in a reactive mode and that you can't help them, you can't soothe them, they can't shut it down very easily. That's another sign. And one of the ways that I um, can test that is if I offer a child something I know they want and they can turn it off, and say okay yeah sure i'll have that then it's not a traumatized response because with the trauma response it's not something you can suddenly turn off right mm -hmm. so where when they react bigger than the moment is like well for instance zones of regulation they talk about um re having an emotional reaction that's equal to the experience that is a very difficult thing for a traumatized person or child to do because an angry fight face might trigger an angry father and then their body gets into this explosive mode and that won't trigger anyone else but it triggered that child and and nobody even knows why he may or he or she may not even know why all they know is that their body is in this reactive state so those are some of the things that help us understand and if that's happening a lot then finding ways to help them understand what that is and moving through that is really useful Fabulous. Thank you very much. All right. So this is some of the behaviors that we may see right. in our classrooms. There are many other. Yeah, there's many others, but you know, that would take a whole half hour. Right. <laughs> right? Yeah. It's not a small subject. It's not. It's a huge topic. Um, yes. But so what, okay, so now we kind of know what trauma is, some of the things that we may see that the, the physical, the mental manifestations of this, the emotional you know maybe not coping very well skills that we're right. you know watching and 
experiencing and having in our classrooms. So what are some, you know, kind of standard practices that you'd like? I know I have my standard practices. I'm like, I want to see everyone having a trauma informed care with everything right. they do. So what are some of the things that you suggest to people to be working on so that they are trauma informed in their relationships with others? Okay, so you mean in general or in, yeah, a yoga in general class? or maybe in a kids yoga class, you know, however okay. you want to term that. All right. Well, a couple of things. One is I think we need to help the children and the adults find both releasing and soothing practices. So, sometimes we need to release and sometimes we need to soothe. If we soothe before we've released, it, I it's kind of like putting your hole on the place where the volcano is about and pretty soon you're so busy plugging every hole that that's mm -hmm. all you're doing you're going around plugging 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 and then there's repression and mm -hmm. we don't want repression that doesn't help anybody so finding ways to release and i helping people identify what release looks like crying is releasing laughing is releasing running any physical sports are releasing um drumming can be releasing games where they get to really move their body can be releasing um, I practice something called TRE, which is trauma releasing exercises. If you haven't heard about that, that's an amazing practice that can do this as well. So um, we want to provide opportunities and recognize when a child is in a place where they need to release. For instance, I use the Hoberman sphere. We started with that many, many years ago. And I've had parents say, <coughs> they threw the ball at me. And I say, well, that's because they need to release. They're not ready to soothe. So if like for all of us, if we're angry or frustrated and we call a friend and we just want them to hear us and they say, oh, just calm down and take a breath. It's annoying mm -hmm. because we need somebody to let us release, let those feelings out, let us cry, let us express our feelings first. And then afterwards, they're soothing. So I give students opportunities to do both, release and soothe. And we practice both of those. And then having soothing activities and really identi identifying them. And everybody has different ones, but the, the yoga calm, well, the yoga classes can provide teachings in both of those. Like for instance, when I, I was invited to a classroom of second grade boys and um, they were pretty wild. They were wonderful. I loved them. And I said, I really want to have fun with you, but um, I need to see that you can get wild and calm. So I played a drum and they got really wild and then we'd rest. And we'd get wild and then rest. So we were moving from wild yeah. feeling to calm, to wild to calm, because regulation isn't just flat. That's actually unhealthy. Regulation is that we can go up and down. We can feel big feelings, and then we know how to soothe them. And we can feel big feelings, and we move up and down with that. So that's one of the most important things, I think, is helping people identify. And then really beginning to see what watching the body I think it's really dangerous to make a list of trauma-informed things to do because what happens with that is the person in front of you, that may not work for them at all. We're just, there are so many different kinds of trauma and there are so many different kinds of people and we all use different techniques and tools. And when we're sharing them, we really have to pay attention. Does this respond like a gentle, quiet class might trigger somebody whose trauma was in a gentle, quiet setting. Mm -hmm. They might feel much more comfortable in bright lights and loud music for now, mm -hmm. you know? And so I, I, I never make lists of things that this is what a trauma informed classroom should look like. People will choose the class that's right for them. If there's a variety, mm -hmm. there are periods in my life when that power yoga and loud stuff really worked. It was helping me release and feel powerful. And there were other times when that actually triggered me and wasn't good at all, but at least those options were available and I could move from class to class. So those are, that's one thing I would say. The other is that um, we just have to keep the communication open. We have to build trust and safety and build a community where people can say, that doesn't feel right, because that's the safest thing to do. If somebody feels like, wow, I didn't like that, that didn't feel safe to me, and they can tell me or the teacher about that, then we're going to have more success than if we try to guess. So get, giving, um, creating an environment where people can actually share what they're feeling, what they need, and beginning to learn to identify what they need. That's really the most important piece of it, I think, is helping people listen to what's happening in their body 
and then being able to communicate what that and then also helping them figure out what they need. Also just education in general about triggers, about flooding, about disassociation. And those can be done in ways that are child friendly, mm -hmm. you know, or adult friendly, depending on what your class is, um, you know, teaching. So those are some things that I, that are on the top of my list. Fabulous. I, I love that personalized approach that you take that, um, you know, if we if we think it looks a certain way and then somebody says, no, that doesn't work for me, then we're like, what? Um, but being able to right. adapt and say, oh, OK, this is, you know, just really being observant. And what are they coming yeah. in with? Where are we in this moment? How can I meet them there? Give them yeah. some some stimulating activities, give them some calming activities, letting them roll through both. Um, move right. their body, breathe in, in ways, have fun, laugh, community, safety. And then for right. them, I think the most powerful thing is for them to be able to choose, for them to have right. choice and um, to check in. Not to do it just because right. the teacher said, but to do it because it feels right. right for me. Exactly. Because if the thing that got lost in trauma is look, control. And so they need to feel a sense of control. And if we're telling them this is what this is what you need, and it isn't, then we're re recreating that pattern for them. So really giving them the chance to say, absolutely not. That doesn't work for me at all. And being able to hear that is really important. Yeah. Well, and I find that it's really hard for um, you know when I go in and I'm like you know okay yeah everybody find a comfortable place for shavasana, right? Mm -hmm. And so one kid just sits. Right. And another lays on their side and another, you know, lays on their stomach, another lays on their back and they're just kind of all over the place. Um, right. I know that I have people in the room, mainly other adults in the room that are like, no, you need to lay down, lay on your back. They're all correcting. Right. And I'm like, no, no, no leave them. <laughs> yes. I gave them the opportunity to choose their comfortable position. Right. And in giving them that opportunity, it provides a, a chance for them to ask the question. Right. What's comfortable for me and where am I going to feel the safest in this right. moment? Right. And so it doesn't have to look a certain way. It has to yeah. feel a certain way. Yes. And sometimes having blankets they can get under so that they can feel that safety or protection. Yeah. And having chairs where they can just sit up or some, some children have to leave the room during relaxation. It's far too much entry into their body. They're not ready for that at all. Mm -hmm. So it, yeah, that's great that you do that. Yeah, right. And just so, so people have a little bit broad, more right. a broader understanding of what it's supposed to look like. Exactly. Right. Fabulous. Yes. All right. And even touch some oh. some children, um, especially depending on the age. Some children are going to want the touch, and some people are going to react to the touch. And you have to be really careful and observant. But you don't make a blanket statement that this is how it's always done. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah. Well, and that's, you know, touch is a very um, explosive topic right now, I'm finding in the yoga world with hands on assists and all that type of stuff. But um, I know always ask for, always ask, right. and then have it student initiated if at all possible. Like with a lot of my kids, especially in my preschoolers and my little kids, I'm like, if you would like a hug, I give hugs yeah. at the end of class. And then exactly. if they want hugs, they can come up and give a hug. If they want two hugs, they can get back in line and give me another one. And other yeah. kids are like, yeah, no, I'm good. I'm, I'm done here. Um, and then it's up to them. Right. Because I worked with a woman who worked at a treatment center and they had a rule, no touch, absolutely. And she said, now they've become the untouchables. Yeah. And how essential for them to learn what healthy touch is. Exactly. And give it in a way that they can ask for it and also push it away if it's not, because that's part of our human need yes. is to be able to touch and be touched in a healthy way. But if we just no touch at all, they feel that, they know that, and that communicates something to them. Yeah. Right. Healthy touch and appropriate, like you said, appropriate touch um, and all those kind of things. And I'm sure we could spend a whole bunch of time I know, talking I know, about that. I know. It's a, tricky, it's a tricky one and I don't want to make that I don't want to say that we just go do you know that we open up and and use touch like you're doing it very carefully again we just can't make blanket statements is my main point exactly all yeah. right so um what I want to get in a little bit for the last part that we're chatting here is kind of what role does yoga and mindfulness play in in the healing of trauma in your own experience and in the experience with the kids that you've worked with yeah. Well, variety of things. One is, uh, the first one is that inner awareness, being able to recognize 
what's happening inside. For instance, we do a pulse count. And when we first started doing that, kids told me that they relaxed when they were playing video games. Mm -hmm. And I said, so what's your pulse doing? And they, they know it's going up. Like, well, that's not a relaxed state. That's something else. It's probably fun and maybe it's escaping and, and entertainment, but it's not really relaxation. Mm -hmm. I want you to really experience what relaxation feels like. So one of the problems in the culture right now is that everybody is so stressed out. Work is stressed. Home is stressed. Life is stressed. The culture is stressed. That There isn't a place to actually experience what relaxation truly feels like. So if they get an opportunity regularly to really feel in their body what relaxation and calm feels like, then they believe it exists. Mm -hmm. As one of my teachers says, oh, I get it. I have to be the lighthouse. Mm -hmm. If the lighthouse is wobbly, then where do they go in a storm? And yoga and mindfulness can be that lighthouse as a place to go to in a storm. And the first piece is that inner um, awareness. Yeah. Um, and then also learning about regulation. They, they can feel it. They can feel when they're um, escalated. They can begin to feel when they're um, calm. And they can begin to learn that they have some control over that, which is really powerful. Because if you, if you explode internally all the time and you don't have any control over it, it's frightening. But if they can learn that a few breaths can actually shut that down or shifting the sh thoughts in their head or doing a few yoga poses or doing a really strong class can actually release some of that tension out of their body, then they've got tools now for living through that. So that's another piece. Um, and then of course, all the soothing activities that they learn and, and building community. Commu one of the reasons why I started it, um, using yoga more than actually counseling, because I worked in a very um, a rural area, had no counselors. And one of the reasons why there were no counselors in the town because no one could afford it because counseling is really expensive mm -hmm. and even if they could afford it they'd only give them five or six sessions with their counts with their insurance which you can't when you've got generations of trauma five or six sessions is not is not going to do anything for you <coughs> so I got tired of referring people to counselors and that never happening that follow-through never occurring for a variety of reasons so I started using yoga because I thought well, then I'll connect them to a healthy community where they can learn about other people that are interested in their bodies and interested in their hearts and learning to listen and share and support one another. And so I think that's another piece that yoga and mindfulness do. They create those communities. And then mindfulness is that opportunity to just begin to be present. Mindfulness, by the way, is very, very difficult for highly traumatized kids because entering their body or entering the present moment it can be extremely painful so sometimes some of the physical activities physical mindfulness practices can or even walking meditations where they can still be hyper vigilant and looking around that gives them a chance to start to experience it in a way that doesn't ask them to shut down their defense mechanisms that they've had since they were babies perhaps so um so I think using a lot of different tools is really important, but we can give those those opportunities where they can glimpse feeling at home in their own skin. And um, those are beautiful opportunities for them. They begin to believe that they can heal. And um, oh, there are so many other things to say, but those are the things that at the top of my head. Do you want to add anything? Oh, there's like you say, I love the fact that you're like, okay, maybe not going, you know, I always talk about mindfulness as we, we start with the outer environment. That's kind of the easiest one is paying attention to, you know, the world around us, you know, yeah. our, our room and nature and those type of things start, you know, as you say, a, a walking meditation, or we're going to go out and we're going to look at all the bugs or we're going to you know, pay yes. attention to the flowers and, and right. do those kind of things. And then I bring it in to the body. Right? And it's like, okay, the next level is becoming aware of our body and how we move and how we breathe and how we feel and our senses and how we interact with right. things and how something, you know, with what textures and smells and tastes, all that kind of loveliness. And finally, yeah. I'm like, the most difficult is paying attention to the brain, noticing your thoughts and your visualizations and your inner talk. And, right. you know, so when dealing with people with, you know, especially like little kids or people when they first are introduced to yoga and mindfulness, I always start with those, the outside stuff, 
-hmm. like let's start with the easier ones <laughs> like, yeah. let's pay attention out here because it's not as you say it's not as you know terrifying right as coming in right um, and I don't, you know, as I want to be healing and helpful, I don't want to cause um, undue stress right. by a practice that should be healing, right? but may not be appropriate in that moment. And I so agree. just gradually working people in, starting with, as you say, bigger body things, um, energetic things, play, fun, laughter, movement, um, instead of saying, you know what, we're going to do a 10 minute seated meditation, ready, set, go. <laughs> right. right 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 exactly. and and even when you go to the um thoughts like when i was in the behavior classroom we often started the day with just checking in with their thoughts now some of their thoughts were terrible and scary and being allowing them to express those before we ever tried to shift anything but having that practice at the very beginning of the day gave them an opportunity to unload mm -hmm. You know, yeah. especially on Monday morning when they'd had a weekend with, you know, maybe they went back to their biological parents and hadn't been, had been away from their foster homes and they needed to say it was really terrifying. I didn't like it. I hated it. And allow those thoughts first and get comfortable with those sort of scary thoughts and allowing those before you start to plant in some of the positives that, that they're not there yet. You know what I mean? just yeah. giving them the chance to express the things that are there personally and having a community that can take that yeah i love doing that with my classes actually it's, you know doing a one word check-in type thing mm -hmm. it's like okay how are you doing where are you at right now and it could be a sensation you know i need to pee yeah, <laughs> right? exactly. okay well exactly. that's where that's you're at exactly. yeah right exactly. and and it doesn't matter where you're at mm -hmm. right what's right. important is the, is the checking in part right Exactly. And I've had kids even afterwards, and they seem to always be very surprised. I often will ask tweens and teens, you know, after a class, so where are we at now? So, you know, before and after. Yes. Um, and I had one young man, and he kind of said, he goes, I didn't like that. Yeah. I didn't, right? He goes, I, 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 feel, I feel uncomfortable. And this was at the end of class. I said, okay. Yeah. And he just kind of sat there and went, what? You're okay with me not being okay? I'm like, yeah. like." It's your feelings. I'm not trying to correct your feelings. They're your feelings. Right. Own them. Yeah. And, you know, other people were other places. Um, but he was just very surprised that, uh, that that was the environment where he could say how he was truly feeling without right. any judgment. Right. From, Good. I wasn't trying to force him to feel a certain way. Yes. And I think that's a really important opportunity that we have as yoga and mindfulness instructors to give kids the there's not a wrong answer here opportunity and and it gets tricky as a teacher i mean i was a teacher for many years because you will get kids that are the class clown that yes. love to always throw out something negative mm -hmm. and throw the whole class off and again it comes back to that is this really how you're feeling or are you trying to mess with the class and you know and and there's a discipline involved as well so you're always walking that line of express how you're feeling but also you know some things are appropriate to express out loud and all the boundaries in the container that goes with expression there's a lot to that as well but mm -hmm. again we could go on for hours about this. <laughs> All right. Well, can you tell people a little bit about this wonderful course that you've developed where they can find some more information about trauma-informed practices? Sure. So we, um, Kathy Flamini, who is a trainer of ours, and I put together a trauma course. It's called Transforming Childhood Trauma. We have it online. I'm coming to Minneapolis and we're teaching it March 10th, I believe. Um, again there and we go through a uh, fight flight and freeze. We teach different yoga poses, uh, yoga sequences for different um, needs. We do the trauma releasing exercises. We talk about the hero's journey. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so you can get it online at our website, uh, Yoga Calm, or um, I'm pretty sure Kathy has it on hers too, thousandpedals.com. She'll definitely have the information about the upcoming live class. That yeah, is. and we invite everybody. We invite everybody to share their own intelligence because we know there are many people out there that are learning all kinds of things. We're on an exciting new area in social emotional learning where people are really opening up to the somatics, opening mm -hmm. up to the impact of trauma, and we're all learning things. So we want to create an environment where we share, but also other teachers have an opportunity. The teachers and participants have an opportunity to share what they've learned as well. 
Thank you. Wonderful. Yeah. It has been a delight chatting with you today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for calling, Donna. All right. You can find more information about Yoga Calm at yogacalm.com, I believe. Dot org. Dot org. Okay. Yogacalm.org. And uh, of course, my name is Donna Freeman and I'm at yoga in my school.com. And uh, please, please uh, have a trauma informed practice. And the more that you can learn about this area, the more sensitive you will be and the more you will be able to serve the students that, you, that come through your door. Yes. So thank you very much. Namaste. Thank you, Donna. Namaste. <laughs> bye bye. Bye.